Ephesians 1 and 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the, in the ones he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. I want to preach this morning, given but not deserved. Given but not deserved. Could we pray together? Lord, I just thank you for this time together with your family. Thank you for your abundant mercy and grace you've given to us. As I share the words of life to your people, let it come alive inside of them. Help us to see and sense that we were doomed without hope. But by your grace, we can be free. Thank you for hope. Thank you for grace today. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Mr. Yacy tells the story of Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway grew up in a very devout, very religious family and Yet there was never never anything that they could talk about, about this experience of the grace of God. He lived a life of low moral standards, and most of us would call him a degenerate. But there was no father, no parent waiting for him, and he sank in the mire and the grace, uh, graceless depression. And the story he wrote perhaps reveals the grace that he only hoped for. In the story of a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son who had run away to Madrid. And the father, in a moment of remorse, takes out this ad in a newspaper, El Libro newspaper. And he said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, Montana at noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. When the father arrived at the square in hopes of meeting his son, he found 800 Pacos waiting to be reunited with their father. Was Paco such a popular name or was a father's forgiveness the the salve for their very soul? Ephesians, the second chapter, the fourth verse But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by the grace of God that we have been saved. I want to talk about something today. I mentioned it earlier, but something that we take for granted that I want to help you to understand the value. Sometimes things that we have that we had over time are handed down to us from a loved one or a parent loses its value, it seems, over time or can become so common. The eighth verse, Ephesians 2, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest no one could boast of it. Verse 7 But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned apportioned it. He did it for us. We could not do it for ourselves. We're in a world with a lot of sound, a lot of noise, a lot of emotions, a lot of stuff. But could I call this church to a solemn assembly today to understand that we sit on these pews or in these seats today and we are in this building and we're on our way to heaven only by the mercy and the grace of God. Grace sounds like an important word, but what does grace really mean? 
You've heard it, I've heard it, that grace means unmerited favor. But what exactly does that mean? Maybe that definition will, well, I can help you understand that definition here by, by this little story that I will tell in a few minutes. Grace is giving or receiving something that is needed, but it's not deserved. How many knows that you need a refreshing of grace every morning? You need the mercy of God. Oh, that was about a third of us. But how many understands that we must have a renewal of that mercy every day? A Sunday school teacher by the name of Lindsay heard this definition of grace. and was quite impressed with the clarity and the simplicity of it. So she tried it out on one of her class of juniors. He repeated this different definition to, to them several times, but it didn't seem to sink in too well. The next day, he was walking down the street, making his way through the piles of snow and slush. And Bobby, one of the boys in his Sunday school class, saw him coming and ducked behind the hedge and made a couple of snowballs. And, and Lindsay said, when I went past him, he fired away. He missed my back, but he hit my right ear. And I saw star, stars for a while, and even my hat flew off. And Bobby saw that it, what he had done, and he ran from that place, and he ran back home. He said, when my head cleared, I was sorely tempted to catch him and beat the daylights out of him, or at least go tell his parents. Then I thought of the Sunday school lesson that decided to practice grace on him. He needed a fishing pole because he had borrowed mine several times. So I went and bought him a three-piece rod and reel and took it by his house. I guess Bobby saw me coming because nowhere around could he be found. I handed it to his mother and I told her to give it to Bobby for a birthday present to tell him that I knew his birthday wasn't but two weeks, uh, two weeks uh, in, in advance, but I wanted him to have it. And so about an hour later, there was a timid knock on my door, and when I opened it, Bobby held the fishing pole out, and he said, I brought your fishing pole back. I just can't take it. And when I asked him why, he answered, if you had known it was me that had hit you in the ear with the snowball, you wouldn't have given me such a beautiful, kind gift. I said, that's why I gave it to you, Bobby. I don't understand, he said. Bobby, what was the Sunday school lesson about yesterday? He said, I don't remember. I said it was about grace and giving. That grace is giving or receiving something that is needed, but it's not deserved. His eyes brightened, a slow grin spread over his face as he began to understand. Bobby now knew the answer of what grace is. I am a recipient today, and you are a recipient of something that we absolutely, positively do not deserve. We can't allow pride to be in ourselves and what we have done and how great we have been. It's only by the grace of God that you and I had breath to get up today. It's only by the grace of God that we were able to go to our jobs this week or do whatever we had to do to care for ourselves or our families. Amen, amen, amen. So that definition fits beautiful into to many places where the word grace is used in the New Testament. Jesus teaches us about grace. The two most important stories that Jesus ever told revolve around the, three, the theme of grace. As we're in a time and a season of revival, one of the greatest stories we can tell as we share in our home groups, as we share on the street corner, as we share in the workplace, and we talk about the grace of God. Do you know people are being eaten alive with shame, with guilt, with fear, with anxiety? But if you can come to them with the word of the Lord, God's grace is sufficient. The prodigal son said, Luke 15, 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven 
and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Suppose his father had agreed to that. Then the story of the prodigal son would not have been worth telling. But I'm sure the most wonderful, wonderful sound that the boy ever heard was the word son. Amen. Son. I tell you today, Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows who you are. Jesus knows what you've been through. Jesus knows what you're suffering. Jesus knows when you fell down. Jesus knows when you've made a mistake. Jesus knows when you've been backing up. But he came today with a word through a messenger to tell you his grace is sufficient. You need to get back up. You need to shake that stuff off. You need to plead the blood of Jesus and let the grace of God flow through your life once again. When the father told the servants to bring a robe and bring some sandals, bring a ring, ring for his son who had been lost and now is found His father gave him not what he deserved, but what he desperately needed. His great need was not for sandals. His great need was not for a beautiful robe, but what he needed, his great need, amen, was to hear his father call him son. I'm not ashamed of you, boy. I'm not ashamed of you. You have always been my son. Come in here. I want to wrap my arms around you. I want to tell you how much I love you. I come to spread some love of Jesus today. When you feel unloved and you feel all alone, you feel like nobody's there, nobody cares, nobody really understands, I come with the love of Jesus because it's greater than your mistakes. It's greater than that fumble of the ball. It's greater than turning right when you turn and turn left. He comes today with his spirit through a messenger to tell you, you are loved more than you could ever imagine. The whole story revolves around his love and his grace. Look at the story of the good Samaritan. When the Samaritan went down that road from Jerusalem to Jericho, he found a Jew who needed help really bad. The Jew didn't deserve anything from the Samaritan because the Jew treated the Samaritans terribly. When they passed the Samaritan, they would cross over to the other side of the road and oftentimes they would curse them and spit in in their direction. But the Samaritans didn't give the Jew what he deserved. He gave him what he needed. I can't tell you how deep I feel this message today. I can't tell you how strong I want to tell you today. I want to help some people that are broken. I want to help some people that are struggling. I want to help some people that have question marks. I want to help some people that have moved back instead of moving forward. I want to tell you that God come with his mercy today and his grace today to take you off the back burner and put you back into the inner circle of where he is and where he loves you. He practiced grace on him. The whole story centers on grace. Oh, we struggle with other people, but there's nobody we struggle with like our own selves. There's nobody that we have more difficult forgiven than our own selves. Our challenge with Ennis and that we have broken our own code of life And our own understanding of who God is becomes distorted. But I want to come with a clear voice to you today. A bold, strong voice to you to tell you that His grace is sufficient. I don't care how many years you've been wound up or bound up in that situation. His grace is sufficient for you. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in effect... Love your enemies. Don't give them what they deserve. Give them what they need. People desperately and despitefully use you and persecute you. Don't treat them the same way that they treat you. 
Don't give them what they deserve, but give them what they need and pray for them. We're in a society, I don't have to tell you, we're in a world of hate. We're in a world that we've never seen anything like it before, but we can't give them what they want, but we've got to give them what they need. The devil knows how to deal with an arguer. The devil loves someone that's a fighter and a quick-tempered person, but the Word of God tells us that we've got to give them what they need, not what they deserve. Someone compels you to go, amen, a mile. The Bible tells us, don't wait for a chance, but go two miles with them. It's like I'm speaking a foreign language here on this Sunday morning. Not only in the teachings of the Lord do we find this principle, but we find it it throughout the whole Bible. Second Kings, we see another illustration of grace. The Syrians were constantly attacking Israel. But every attack failed because God was revealing the plans of the Syrian army to the prophet Elisha. God will reveal the enemy's plan before he's able to implement it. If you have an ear to the Lord, he's going to speak clearly to you about that situation. And most of the time, it requires prayer and intercession to foil the enemy's plans. Then Elisha told the king of Israel who would immediately take steps to protect his people. The king of Syria was so frustrated that he called his officers together and declared that there must be a a cheater, a traitor among us. But one of his officers was wiser than the others and told him that Elisha, the prophet of God, knew every single word that the Syrian king said in private and was passing them them on to the king of Israel. So, the, excuse me, the king of Syria was sent a strong force to capture Elisha at his home in Dothan. But God blinded the soldiers. And while they were blind, Elisha came and led them to the capital of Israel. And that then asked God to open their eyes. They saw that they were surrounded by the army of Israel. The king of Israel was ready to kill them all, but Elisha stopped them. He told the king to give them food and treat them kindly and let them return to their master homeland. Now here in this last sentence is the account. 2 Kings 6, 23. So bands of Syrians came no more into the land of Israel. Elisha gave them not what they deserved, but what they needed. And he ended a war. Many times, we want to end the war our way. We want to take things in our own hands and end them our way. We pick up the the tone from, from the world. We pick up the theories from the world or the spirit of the world. And if we're not careful, we begin to operate like that. But something tells me to get back to the Word. How do I do it right? How do I live it right? I want to live it His way. And somebody said, Amen. It's a good principle. Turn to somebody and say, It's a good principle. And it's the secret of much happiness. It's a pity that it isn't used more often. But next we look at the actions of Jesus. They also revolve around this word called grace. The world didn't deserve for Jesus to leave his heavenly home and come to this earth and suffer. The world didn't deserve that. But the world needed Jesus very, very bad. One day they brought a woman taken in sin and threw her down in the dust in front of Jesus. A crowd gathered around. The Pharisee asked, what shall we do with her? Because this woman was a very sinful woman. A woman that had done many sinful things and very deserving of great judgment. John 8 and 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say, Jesus? 
I think that Jesus looked at the Pharisees a long time. Maybe he knelt down in the dirt and began to right some of their wrongs and right some of their sins and some of those things that they had done. But with pity and compassion in his voice, slowly he stooped and wrote in the dust, Amen, if any of you be without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Amen. I don't know what all you've done, boys. I, I, well, I did know. I, I, I don't know all the things that, that, that uh, are facing you today, but I will tell you that Jesus has already been there, and he's seen what's been written in the sand. He's already seen what the thoughts of your mind were. He's already seen the things that you have done or planned to do, but he come today with me to this pulpit to say, I will erase those things. Go and sin no more. Jesus' last words, John 8 and 11, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He gave her what she needed, not what she wanted maybe, but what she deserved. He did not give her what she deserved, but she got what she needed. He practiced grace on her in all probability, completely changed her life. But maybe the most wonderful instant of grace of Jesus was at the end of his earthly life as Jesus is being tried before Pilate And here the Roman soldiers take him to the whipping post and they tie his hands above his head and the whips lash out with the sickening thud and they hit his bare back and again the whips are tearing into his skin and cutting him to shreds and blood is trickling down over his garments. A Roman soldier unties the ropes that hold Jesus to the post and Jesus slumps now to the ground and they douse him with water and then bring a crown of sharp thorns and place it upon his head and two of them possibly, amen, pushing that thorns and pressing it down really painfully hard and a heartbreaking moan comes from the lips of the Lord and blood is running down his face and down his neck and down his body. Then they took him through the streets and they nailed him to the cross and as they do, he lifted his face to heaven and earnestly prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. I want to tell you, we live today with grace strong in our lives, but they don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. You know what you're doing, but they don't know. So we come with the grace of God to a world that does not deserve him with all of the life they're living and all of the debauchery that they're involved in. But we come with truth to them to say there is grace and mercy. No matter how you treated Jesus, no matter how you've lived, no matter how you've trampled on his grace, no matter how you spit in his face, No matter how many times you've used his name in vain, I come to you today with a merciful God that loves you. You haven't gone too far. You haven't said too much. You haven't done too many bad things that he can't save you. Yes, his whole life evolved around the principle of grace. What does that mean to us? We're in such a judgmental world. We're in such an offended world. Everything offends. Everything is taken out of context, or much is. Too many, too many are offended. Does it mean that Jesus wants us to make grace the dominating principle of our lives? What difference would that make? Hatred, grudges would disappear. Instead of chips on our shoulders, we would have lumps in our throat with our compassion for lost and hurting people. Heartbreaks would change into smiles. Worries and ulcers would be ultimately eliminated. Divorce courts would be covered with dust. If the concept of grace could bleed through us, 
Give them another chance. Give them the benefit of the doubt, whatever it is. But there's a great article that illustrates the concept of grace written by a well-known theologian that I want to read to you. He said, one of my more memorable seminary professors had a practical way of illustrating to his students the concept of grace. At the end of a strong evangelism course, he would distribute the exam and with the caution to read it all the way through before beginning to answer it. And the caution was written on the exam as well. Read it all the way through before you answer it. And he said, as we read the test, it becomes unquestionably clear to each of us that we had not studied nearly enough. And the further we read, someone was, one of the students was saying, we, the, the worse it became. And about halfway through, audible groans could be heard throughout the whole lecture hall. On the last page, however, was a note that read, you have a choice. You can either complete the exam as given or sign your name at the bottom. In so doing, receive an A for the assignment. Wow, we sat there stunned. Was he really serious? Just sign it and get a name. Slowly, the point dawned on us. And one by one, we turned in our test and silently filed out the room. When I talked with the professor about it afterward, he shared some of the reaction he had received through the years. Some students began to take the exam without reading it all the way through. And they would sweat it out for the entire two hours of class time before reaching the last page. Others read the first two pages and became really angry, turned in the test blank and stormed out of the room without even signing it. They never realized what was available. As a result, they lost out totally and got a failing grade. One fellow, however, read the entire test, including the note at the end, but decided to go ahead and take the exam anyway. He didn't want any gifts. He wanted to earn it his own way, and he did. He turned it in, and he made a C, but he could have easily made an A. The story illustrates many people's reaction to God's solution to sin. Some people look at God's standard, moral, ethical perfection, and they throw their hands up and say, I can't do this stuff. This is too much. Too much is required of me. Amen. Why even try? They tell themselves, I could never live up to all this stuff. I could never complete this whole test. Others, like the student who read the test through and was aware of the professor's offer, took the test anyway because I'm just unwilling to accept and receive something that is too, amen, seems to be too good to be true. I'm too good to receive God's gift of forgiveness. I've been through too much. There is no way this thing is going to be free. But God's grace is truly like the professor's offer. It seems unbelievable. But if you'll read it on through, he said it's a free thing. This world, the way of a transgressor is hard. The way of the sinner is hard. But if you'll read my book, I will give you an escape plan. And you can get through this thing. You don't have to carry the burden of questions you don't have answered. You don't have to carry the burden about sin and guilt and shame but if you'll read this thing through I will forgive you of all of your sins the boy stood defiantly and said go ahead and give it to me the principal looked at the young rebel and asked how many times have you been here do you know how many times you've been in this office The child answered rebelliously, apparently not enough. You've been punished each time, the principal said. Yes, I've been punished. If that's what you want to do, go ahead. Do it again. I can take it. What if you dish out? I don't care what you do to me. I always have, he says, and 
No thought of your punishment enters your head till the next time you decide to break the rules. You never think ahead, son. You never think ahead. Nope. I do whatever I want to. Whenever I want to, ain't nothing you people going to do to stop me doing it either. The principal looked at the teacher who stood nearby. What did he do this time, teacher? Fighting. He's always fighting. He's got a bad attitude in everything he does. He shoved Tommy's face in the sandbox. He's always in trouble. The principal looked at the boy What did Tommy do to you? Nothing. I don't like the way he looked at me. So I just hit him. The teacher stiffened, but a quick look from the principal stopped him as he quietly said, today is the day you learn about grace. Grace, isn't that what you old people do before you eat your meals? I don't need none of your stinking grace, he said. Oh, but you do, said the principal. The principal studied the young man's face, whispered as the music comes. Oh, yes, yes, you truly do. The boy continued to glare at the principal with contempt. He continued with his almost snarl verbally. The principal continued, grace in its short definition is unmerited favor. You can't earn it. It's a gift, and it's always freely given. It means that you will not be getting what you so richly deserve. The boy looked really puzzled now. So you're not going to whoop me, or are you going to whoop me? You're going to let me walk? The boy studied the face of the principal, looking for answers. No punishment at all? Is that what you're saying? Even though I socked Tommy, shoved his face in the sand, oh, there has to be punishment, young man. What you did was wrong, and there's always consequences to our actions. There will be punishment. Grace is not an excuse for doing wrong. I knew it sneered the boy as he held out his hands. Let's get on with it. I knew you were a liar. The principal nodded toward the teacher. Bring me the belt. The teacher presented the belt to the principal. He carefully folded it in two, and then he handed it back to the teacher. He looked at the child and said, I want you to count the blows. The principal walked over to stand directly in front of the young man. He gently reached out and folded the child's outstretched hands, expected hands together, and then turned to face the teacher with his own hands outstretched. One quiet word came forth from his mouth, began. The belt whipped down on the outstretched hands of the principal with a crack. Pop. The young man jumped. I thought you were going to hit my hands. Why is he hitting your hands? Shock went across his face. The boy whispered, two. Now it raised an octave. His voice is starting to crack. Three. I can't believe this, Mr. Principal. Four. The boy now had tears rolling up in his eyes. This rebel was now realizing something. That's enough. Stop. The principal didn't do anything. I did it. The belt came down again on the principal's hands. Pop. The child flinched with each blow and tears now streaming down his face. Please, no, no, do me, do me. The boy begged for mercy with the principal. I'm the one that deserves it. He doesn't deserve it. Please stop. The blows kept coming, kept coming. Finally, it was over. The principal stood with sweat running down his face. He studied the young man. The young man looked at his hands that were now swelling with welts across them. He reached out to cradle the face of the weeping child and said, that's what grace is, son. That's what grace is. Grace come to you, amen, today. 
Would you stand? Grace is Calvary. Grace is when Jesus said, you deserve it, but I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you what you need. Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Grace came to you through the sacrifice of Calvary. Jesus received the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. His back was whipped. The idols that we've bent our backs to, nails were driven through his sinless hands to the things that we've done with our hands. Nails driven through his feet for the paths that we've chosen to walk. Crown of thorns for the things that we've given our minds to. Yes, and a bleeding heart, and compassion and love for us. We're in a solemn place today where the presence of the Lord is and where His grace is abundant. 